So the, the focus of this session is supposed to be about the neurobiology, the brain, and the, uh, the, the feeding and, and uh, feeding habits and sensory inputs to that. And I, I don't like the idea of uh, the brain being a, a black box, although given the talk that Steve just gave us, I could say, you know, just consider everything he just said when you think about the brain. And I want to talk about what are the inputs and the outputs of the brain. Um, and, and I want you to keep in mind that there's a particular challenge here, which is that from the point of view of our species and the forces that help shape us to be who and what we are as a species today, the challenge is that we are a globally distributed omnivore. That is to say, we get our nutrition by foraging very widely among a huge range of different kinds of foods, plants and animals alike. And we do this in an enormous range of varieties, everything from the desert to the jungle and everything in between. And this is true not only from where we originated within Africa itself, but all over the entire planet today. So the inputs that I want to consider are the sensory cues, and my particular interest is in taste and smell. And I would include in that the nutrient signals themselves. And we now know of research in the last decade or so that many of the uh, signals that come from the upper airways, the mouth and the nose, are also throughout the GI tract and the lower airways for that matter and are providing signals of what nutrients are present, not only as we eat, but as we take them into the GI tract. There are also internal metabolic consequences of these, which we're aware of. We track what's inside our blood, and that these are all you know, instruments that come back to, to feed upon the brain. And of course, the brain gives rise to the sensations themselves, what is sweet and what smells yummy. Uh, and these, these also give rise to internal states, which integrate the metabolic consequences of what we ate with the sensory signals. And I would include in that, we're going to hear more about rewards today, and I like to be contrary. So I'm going to talk not only about rewards, but also about punishment. And our brain not only likes to reward us for doing good things, our brain likes to punish us for doing bad things. Uh, a lot of what the brain does is associate the, the signals that come in with the consequences, the nutritional metabolic consequences of that, so we are an association machine, and in fact, any animal, I would argue, that is an, a foraging omnivore um, is going to have to be in order to learn how to live in the world. And this gives rise to our food decisions. Um, we have to select from the array of foods in the back of the room what we are going to go for, the fruit or the yogurt or the bagel. Uh, our expectations of, of what is going to happen when we eat these foods, and in fact, if you bit into a, a piece of fruit and what you were expecting was not met, you would probably spit the food back out. So expectations are very important. And this gives rise to habits and our feeding habits. And it's actually very advantageous to develop feeding habits because these allow our body to expect and know what's coming in. And we really want to be able to expect what's coming in because it greatly helps us utilize those associations. and. Uh, predict what's coming in to better handle them as they come in. So when I was in college, minoring in anthropology, one of my professors, Harold Dibble, um, had created this slide, and it's, it's stayed with me all my life. This is a slide of uh, the evolution of the human brain going from Homo habilis to Homo erectus to Homo sapiens, and the brain gets bigger and bigger. And his point is the things that our brain is devoted to focusing on has not changed. We've just be become much better at it. And I think that this, too, is a really important point. Um, and I won't say more about that. So now, uh, in the context of talking about evolution, I want to get biblical on you a little bit. So there's a biblical reference to the land of milk and honey, which, of course, is a reference to paradise. So why do we refer to paradise as the land with milk and honey? It's the place where you get butter and sweet things. I think that there's something embedded within that concept. Both paradise is about food, not other things, which I think is interesting in and of itself, but even particular foods. We have a love affair with sweet things and fat and dairy things. And you know, the, the, uh, what, what it is best exemplified by milk, of course, is going to be butter and cheese and things like that. So 
I think sort of sub-questions that come from this is there are evolutionary pressures that, that have acted on us for, for millions of years that have led us to have certain likes and dislikes and certain loves. And they, they come from our story, from our history. So I think sort of sub-questions that come from you know, our, our construing paradise as a place where you get butter and, and sweet things is that we, we actually do have a great love affair with, with dairy. Why is butter so good? Why is butter so yummy? And why is it hard to replace it with something else? We really dig butter. And sweet things as well. Our species really like sweet things. And this isn't true of all, even mammals. We, we, we now know, because of some research done recently at Monell, that, uh, that, that basically all obligate carnivores are incapable of tasting sweet. Or at least they lack the sweet taste receptors. So we have maintained that ability. They've lost it, we've maintained it. We are a species that really likes things that taste sweet. We also seem to have a great attraction to starch. Our breakfast yesterday consisted here of uh, fruit, muffins, uh, danishes, and bagels. Uh, this I know you wouldn't find in Europe necessarily as a breakfast, but this is typical of Americans wanting to eat uh, pancakes and waffles and muffins and things like that for breakfast. And most of the world thrives and gets a lot of its calories from rice and noodles and grains and we have a great, uh, a great attraction for starch. Similarly for fermentation. Um, we like a lot of fermented foods. We like cheeses, we like preserved meats, we like breads, we like wine, we like beer. And I think that one of the reasons we really like these foods is because uh, and related to our like for sweet, which is that we have a frugivorous origin. We are, we are fruit eaters. And I'll talk in a, in a minute about the fact that we are apes. We are a member of the class of great apes, which are largely frugivorous animals. And when you're a fruit-eating animal, you're going to like fermentation because fruit fall from trees and they sit on the ground and they begin to ferment. And so you can't be a fruit-liking animal. So there's another animal that lives very much like we do and has, in, in fact, so much of the same uh, likes and dislikes that we have that they are considered a human commensal, and that is the fruit fly. So if you have a bowl of fruit lying around in your kitchen table and it starts to get a little bit old and a little bit overripe, you'll eventually see fruit flies attracted to it. The little, actually, they're strictly speaking vinegar flies, but they'll be buzzing around it, Drosophila, and they love these things. It just so happens that these same animals love beer. They love wine. They love bread. In fact, I've had the experience of if you have a bowl of rotting fruit on your kitchen table and you take fresh baked bread out of your oven and you put it on the kitchen table and you cut it open, they'll all move from the rotting bananas and peaches over to the bread. The love of fermented things comes from being frugivorous. And we also seem to like cooking. We really like browning reactions. So things like fresh baked bread, speaking of which, cakes, cinnamon buns, um, cookies, uh, and even uh, meats, grilled meats, ribs, barbecue. We really like these things. And you can find these in virtually any culture. Grilled ribs and meats are sort of omnipresent and culturally on Earth. These all have browning reactions in them. These are the Maillard reactions that occur from cooking. And I think that cooking is also an important part of our, of our history. So there's a concept in evolutionary biology of when you last shared a common ancestor. So this is going forwards in time when you diverged and going backwards in time when you coalesce. So these are all the great apes, uh, or the apes spanning from gibbons all the way to us. And our last common uh, cousins along this ape lineage uh, were the chimpanzees and closely behind that in evolutionary time were the gorillas. And the coalescence time from when we last shared a common ancestor with them was about six million years or so. And more recently, these are the guys, some of these, not all of them, are, are our um, direct ancestors of, of the Australopithecines and the hominids. So on the left is uh, a a a Australopithecus afarensis, and all the way on the right is Homo sapiens sapien. And right behind that, as a member of our species that is not in our direct lineage, which is uh, Homo sapien Neanderthals. And I think it's interesting to ask a question, 
not only were, what are, were these guys eating, but what were these guys eating. So we know quite a bit about what apes eat. Uh, we know that great apes, including us, are all of African origin. We're all omnivorous. We all eat small amounts of meat, except for some humans that pride themselves in being largely carnivorous. And for the most part, all of these species and most humans are vegetarian with a particular love for fruit. Certainly the apes love fruit. According to Jane Goodall, who has spent a lot of time with chimpanzees studying pantroglodyte, uh, which is our closest living relative with whom we share about 99% of our genes, they eat an omnivorous diet, which is consisting of about 10 to 15% vegetable matter, 5 to 10% animal flesh, including both mammals and insects, and about 80% of what they consume is fruit. So in red there, I have the question uh, th that I want to focus on, which is, do the diets of the various great apes resemble the diet of our last shared common ancestor? In other words, is what the chimpanzee eating related irrelevant to what we eat? because they're not a direct ancestor of ours, but we share a common ancestor. So given all, all of these apes eat fruit and are fruit-loving animals and like these things, the question I raise, is it possible that our common ancestor ate something similar to this and that we still carry this in our genes, which is why we love fruit, which is why we love sweet things, which is why we love fermentation products. It doesn't explain why we love cooking or why we love starch, however. So here in, in, in a different kind of timeline, this is our evolutionary tree. Time is running from the bottom up towards the top. And all the way uh, over to the right is where uh, Homo sapiens sapiens is branching off at the end there. And this, this line here, this red line, indicates when people think cooking came to be. Now, it's debated exactly when cooking came in, came in to, to use, but people generally agree it was about a million years ago. I guess the range people debate is around 1.2 million to maybe as recently as 500,000 years ago. But one of the things you can see on this tree is that it predates our species. That, that our ancestors before Homo sapiens sapiens existed were cooking, which is an important concept here. This red line uh, indicates when agriculture came into being, farming. So on an evolutionary tree here, you can see that that happened yesterday. This wasn't very long ago. So people, again, debate when this happened, but it, it averages about 10,000 years ago. I guess the range, again, is around 8 to 12,000 years ago, but it's pretty recent. So this raises an interesting question. You can see that since cooking's been around this long, that it's had a long time to influence us and our evolution and the, the relationship we have with foods. So you have to ask yourself the question, is 10,000 years long enough for evolution to happen? So evolution happens much faster than you might imagine, and in our species it appears to be even accelerating. We seem to be evolving faster than we used to in the past. So a paper came out in PNAS a few years ago in 2007 by Henry Harpening, and he, and then I quote, says, the past 10,000 years have seen rapid skeletal and dental evolution in human populations, as well as the appearance of many new genetic responses to diet and disease. And these are some that people think are direct responses to agriculture. So one is in response to malaria and vector diseases, the heme groups and sickle cell um, have resulted in duplications, mutations, and many gene conversion events occurring within these heme groups. And what is the relationship of that to agriculture? Well, in order to grow large plains of crops, you have to cut down forests and trees. So now you, your water handling abilities have radically changed, and water tends to pool and not be processed by forests any longer. And where water pools, you have mosquitoes for high starch intake. So we've been eating starch for a very, very long time. Since cooking's been around, we've probably been making some kind of bread. Um, but we haven't had easy access to vast quantities of starch that would come with agriculture. So we also think that recently, within the last 10,000 years or so, we've developed um, copy number variants of the salivary amylase gene. Now, we carry two amylase genes. One's pancreatic, the other is the salivary amylase gene. Only the salivary amylase gene, which pre-digests food for you, has copy number variants. But it happens to be one of the most highly variant copy number variants in the human genome. And this is thought to be a very recent adaptation. And obviously, amylase is there to process starch that's coming in the mouth, at least in the case of salivary amylase. And of course, in the case of, of uh, whether the lactase gene remains active or not, or how it's regulated, 
that this is thought to be related to dairy farming and our ability to maintain actively herds and use herds and process this, which is also uh, a recent agricultural adaptation. I also think that there's some interesting information to be gleaned from looking at our ancestors in dentition. So in the upper left there is the chimpanzee, not one of our direct relatives, um, pan troglodytes. And then going from uh, left to lower right, we have uh, Africans, habilis, Neanderthals, who is not one of our direct relatives, but lived concurrently with us. And in the lower right is us. Now you all know that incisors are cutting tools and that molars are crunching tools. So when you look at the um, Africans or habilis in the upper, middle, and right, you can see that they have fairly small cutting teeth and quite large molar crunching teeth, which means that their diet probably involved them doing a lot of crunching of tough, difficult to chew foods. Um, if you look at Neanderthals, they have very few molars and they tended to live in Europe during ice ages when there wasn't a lot of plant matter around and were probably eating a lot of, a lot of meat and doing a lot of hunting. But if you compare pan troglodyte in the upper left and humans in the lower right, we have very similar dentition. We have small, modest molars compared to some of the others, yet we have molars, unlike Neanderthals, and we have similar looking cutting teeth. And so I think, again, this suggests that the chimpanzee diet, which is largely fruit, they're a sweet-loving animal, a fruit-loving animal, and Homo sapiens sapiens is very similar, or should be, or was very similar. So whereas North American and European Homo sapiens, including Neanderthals, may have lived a carnivorous Inuit-like life during the last ice age, which I think is indicated by the fact that they don't have um, a lot of molars and a lot of cutting teeth because they didn't have a lot of plant matter to chew because when the land's covered in ice, like Inuit have, you eat a lot of animal flesh, not a lot of plant flesh. Most geographic regions in which Homo sapiens sapiens lived were not ever covered by ice and would not have had the same pressure to hunt exclusively and live carnivorously. And I raise this point because there are now some people, including some academics, talking about the fact that we're supposed to be living in caves, eating exclusively raw food, which doesn't make sense because cooking predates our species, and eating largely carnivorous meals and that we weren't really meant to be plant eaters. We were meant to be Raquel Welch with her spear hunting mastodons or whatever she was doing. But this is a picture of the last ice age um, about 18,000 years ago. And you can see both the Antarctic at the bottom, which didn't really cover any land other than the Antarctic, and the, uh, the Arctic at the top there came down and covered Canada, parts of the United States, uh, large portions of Europe but really wouldn't have affected Africa or Asia or Australia or Indonesia or Malaysia. And in fact, if you look at this map here, where all those numbers appear uh, uh, on, speckled across the, the continents there, you can see that early, uh, early Homo sapiens sapiens were living throughout Africa, throughout Asia, in Australia, Indonesia, Malaysia, and of course Europe. And the light blue, which might be hard for you to see there, is Neanderthals, which was largely in Europe and was affected by the Ice Age. So we were living in areas that were really not affected by the Ice Age. So it doesn't make sense to think that like, we didn't evolve with cooking or that we were so affected by the Ice Age that we should just be meat eaters. That doesn't really make sense to me, at least. So in this great range of land that we're living in as omnivores, how did we survive amidst such great breadth of flora and fauna? So I think that key to this are the chemical senses. The oral detection uh, is central to our nutrition and health. And we use taste and the senses to detect macronutrients. So savory tastes indicate protein somehow. Uh, carbohydrates are, are indicated, at least sugars are indicated by sweet taste. And fats are indicated by the perception of creaminess or perhaps fat detectors in the mouth micronutrients like minerals and vitamins. Some of them are detected. Of course, salt tastes salty and we like that. And it's also important to consider that throughout this, we're not only re required to procure nutrients, as Steve explained in the last talk, in order for us to survive, but it's also important for us to avoid toxins. Now, if you are living on the edge and you eat toxins, you're in serious trouble. They can, they can bring you grave harm. And this is important for us to detect and avoid. It's just as important for us to detect and avoid as it is for us to find nutrients in our food. And of course, medicines, we all, we all know, not only are, are, are poisons, but are, can also be medicines. So they also have anti-cancer, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory properties. And there are toxins in virtually everything we eat. 
So I want to sort of, with this evolutionary perspective and what we are um, perhaps evolved to eat, keep in mind that this is not only an old problem, this is a current problem. That in, in the face of the obesity epidemic, there are people who don't have enough to eat. So the planet right now is simultaneously facing overnutrition and undernutrition. So an overall lack of sufficient energy and protein to enable growth, otherwise known as marasmus and quarsiacore, are the leading causes of death in children on Earth today. Um, the second leading cause of death is diarrhea, which causes a loss of minerals and water. And these kill millions and millions of children every day. It's a lack of nutrition. Overnutrition or obesity on an evolutionary scale is probably a relatively modern problem. And really, evolution wouldn't care about it, I don't think, because from the point of view of it shortening your life and making you sick, you will have already reproduced. Obesity will kill you perhaps when you're 40 instead of when you're 60, but it won't stop you from reproducing when you're 16. And I think that, that evolution is going to be greatly concerned with us procuring nutrients and avoiding toxins, not worrying about obesity. So globally right now, if I have this number correct, there are about a billion people who are malnourished, lacking required minerals and vitamins in addition to calories. So I think that we can argue that the forces that were acting on us over tens or hundreds of thousands or millions of years and the everyday need to identify foods that will safely deliver water, macronutrients, micronutrients is not only ancient but it's a still very present force shaping human evolution and the dietary practices of our species today. That the way we think and feel and relate to food and, and eat food and the things that we like are still very much about keeping us alive. Now, taste and odor cues guide our intake in that they help us to identify nutritious foods and to avoid toxic foods. This is a cartoon of a taste bud, which is throughout the oral cavity, in the tongue, in the soft palate, and in the pharynx. You have them all over your mouth. You don't have them under your tongue. You don't have them on your cheeks. But this is where salt tastes, sweet tastes, savory tastes, bitter tastes, and any other tastes that may exist are originating. These are sent to the brain as sensory signals and go to a variety of areas of the brain throughout. They go up through the brain stem and project to cortex, to forebrain, to midbrain, and all around. And one of the things that I find particularly interesting about this map of the gustatory projection fields is that they're almost perfectly superimposed on the maps of brain imaging areas that we get from people in fMRI magnets being asked to make major life decisions. So if you ask people, think about the person you're dating now and whether you want to spend the rest of your life with them, or consider these two houses and think about which house you want to buy, the parts of the brain that light up are these areas. So I think that the brain areas that are involved in processing taste and flavor and food cues are the same brain areas that are involved in making major life decisions. And this is important because this is how we get the energy to keep us alive, and this is how we know whether if what we're going to swallow is going to kill us or not. And this is how we evolved, I think. So the flavor cues also have to become associated with metabolic consequences to give us the reward and punishment to guide our digestive processes and to help us form dietary habits. So this is extremely important because in the case of an individual meal, we not only have to know what's coming in to prepare for it, but it also has to help form the habits that are going to give rise to a like for a particular food and a desire to eat it again in the future. This is a picture of Ivan Pavlov in his laboratory with an assistant and one of his dogs. And he was really interested in how our ability to predict and anticipate cues coming in in associations enabled digestion to occur. And in a nutshell, what he concluded was that in the absence of predicting and anticipating foods coming in, in forming these associations, we don't really digest much at all. So I want to sort of turn it around and talk about not only procuring nutrients to keep us alive, but the importance of avoiding toxins. We don't spend a lot of time thinking about avoiding toxins because when you buy food from the grocery store, it's a safe assumption they're probably not poisonous. But this, again, is not something that we evolved to deal with. There weren't grocery stores um, long, long, long ago. 
So we must worry about avoiding nutrients or anti-nutrients, um, otherwise known as toxins, just as much as procuring nutrients. And virtually everything we eat will contain some toxins. So we have a lot of tolerance of toxins. In fact, in some cultures, we seem to revel in, in eating foods that contain toxins and are, are tasting bitter. But we never seem to like foods that are very strongly bitter and have high levels of toxins. And because of this, we've evolved reflexes, brainstem reflexes that are stereotype behaviors both the receptors for these are in our genes and the motor behaviors are in our genes. And here's survival lesson number one. If you have something very strongly bitter in your mouth, you're going to reject it. This is a boy tasting some medicine pictured here. And just to show you how important this is in, in the world, I like this picture because this is showing how, how animals and nature actually make use of these toxins to protect themselves. This is a cinnabar uh, caterpillar, uh, a moth larvae. And they're very, very uh, dramatic looking. They're, they're very bright orange and black alternating stripes, and you can spot them from a mile away. And animals, birds that might be inclined to eat these, know that they should not eat them because they like to feed on, on ragwort. And ragwort contains alkaloids that are extremely toxic. So there are a lot of different kinds of alkaloids, and they can cause everything from neural damage to liver damage. They can make you go blind. They can cause paralysis. They can kill you. And if uh, an, an animal that's, that's, that's grazing happens to eat some of this, just eating a couple plants of ragwort is sufficient to kill an adult workhorse. These are very potent toxins. So this is an animal that's using these toxins to ward off predators, but it's very important for humans not to eat these things. So getting at the concepts of reward and punishment, and in this case, since we're going to hear more about reward later, I'm going to talk about punishment. The somatic sensation of nausea, which is a feeling that comes from the body, a, a body sensation of malaise, is induced when the body identifies a consumed food as poisonous. When you've been poisoned, you don't feel well, and that's a body sensation. It connotes a strong negative affect, which, like pain, is protective and teaches us don't do it again. It's one thing to feel sick. It's another thing for your body to punish you while you're feeling sick. And nausea is akin to pain. You don't have to feel pain. Your body wants you to feel pain. Just as your body doesn't have to feel nausea, it wants you to feel nausea. It is punishing you. It is saying, don't do this, please. So we hypothesized that oral exposure to bitter tasting stimuli would be nauseating at high concentrations, as it would predict the potential ingestion of toxins, which often taste bitter. So I'm making a direct parallel here to the work of Ivan Pavlov in that he felt that the anticipation of what was coming in would prepare the body for what was about to happen. And I think that the same thing's true for tasting bitter stimuli and the body preparing for that by telling you, you're about to be poisoned if you eat this and punishing you right then and there for putting this in your mouth. And without getting into the details of the study, we asked the question, does bitter tasting compounds induce nausea? And the, the answer is, not for everybody. It does for many people, specific people who are prone to nausea. And it has to be a very strong bitter taste. Drinking coffee doesn't make people nauseous, but very strong tasting bitter stimuli are punishing. And we published this work in Current Biology. So in conclusion, I think that our bodies struggle to maintain healthy tissues by supplying nutrients when needed, hopefully not too little and hopefully not too much. This is an ancient struggle that still affects a billion humans on Earth today. Taste guides us towards nutritious food and away from toxins, and taste is central to our survival in doing this. Dare I say that I think taste is probably the one sense that humans really cannot live without. We all know that we can live uh, unable to see in this world. We can live with the inability to hear in this world. But it's very difficult for people to live if they cannot taste. And in fact, the inability to taste is very, very rare. There are few individuals that ever um, have this state fall upon them because it's a very well-defended sense, and it is one of the few regenerative tissues we have. Ingestion is a challenge to physiological homeostasis, and we can handle the influx of nutrients best when we prepare and anticipate foods, and we form dietary habits. Expectation is key, which requires reward and punishment, and requires learning of the sensory cues and the outcomes. This is not only true in preparing for incoming nutrients, but also for avoiding and processing anti-nutrients and toxins, which is the flip side of the picture. And I think that these processes are really what fascinated Ivan Pavlov and fascinate me, and are ultimately why he was awarded the Nobel Prize. 
I just want to acknowledge some of my collaborators and some of the nausea and bitter taste work. Uh, Kathy Parrott de Gachon at uh, Monell along with Gary Beecham and Ken Cook and Bob Stern who are probably the two world's experts on nausea. And this work was also funded by the NIH NIDCD. Thank you.